Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for this warm place to meet and uh, that we can uh, look at this parable and and f try and see what you are trying to say to the scribes and Pharisees and the others about what kind of God you are, that we don't have any misconceptions or uh, don't realize who you are and how much you care for us. Ask your Holy Spirit to guide us today and to, that we can see and hear what you want us to see and hear. In your name I pray, amen. So we'll do this uh, video. They do such a, such a good job with this, but I get a bang every time out of the, they're doing it in King James. And so all the, I, I don't think Jesus really talked in King James English, but, but they do a beautiful job with the video. So last week we talked about a lot about the Father and, uh, and how out of place this was for a father to ever give his inheritance ahead of time and that this really meant that the father was uh, in those, if that would have happened, it would have meant that the father was foolish, an easy mark, uh, wouldn't have had much backbone. And so that was not the kind of God figure that they were looking for. And, and the prodigal son was, in, in other words, saying, I want to live as though you're dead. And we talked about that last week about uh, once you get your inheritance back then, it was as if you wanted your father dead or I want to live as though my father is dead. So <clears throat> we talked a lot about that uh, last week. Um, uh, we left off last week and uh, I told a couple of uh, instances when I went to Seattle the week before, I uh, met friends in, that had uh, sons that are children that have gone away and in and, uh, and this whole parable, well, we, we've been working with a young man back home who's uh, 17 and so, you know, what do you do with a 17 year old? Do you let him go or do you try and pursue him? And, uh, and this waiting father with this son who looks to be in that age group, let him go and you got to wonder, why did he do that? Why did he portray Jesus portrayed God as a shepherd, as a, the kind of God that is God, and looking for a lost sheep who wandered away because of just stupidity or curiosity, wandered away, or why did he portray him as a crazy woman searching for a lost coin who really had nothing to do with being lost, it just slipped through the cracks. And now we get to uh, Jesus portraying God as a waiting father who has a son and the waiting father lets the son leave and doesn't go after him. And, and we got to ask, why did he turn the tables on this when we've got this pursue, pursue, pursue? Uh, Luke 19, 10, for the son of man came not, for the son of man came to seek and to save that which was lost. The whole Luke is about seeking and saving the lost, going after him. And here we've got this uh, uh, instance where he doesn't go after him. Um, why do you think that, that uh, he is doing this? What, why would he, at that point, not go after him? Any ideas? To show that people have a choice, that they can make a decision that can be wrong, and then they can learn from it. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That it, and um, there is a there is a point where he could have uh, the father wasn't didn't have to give the son the inheritance he could have said no you're staying here uh, no you're not leaving you're staying here he could have forced him to stay and uh, a pastor that I am friends with had a, a young guy call him up and he he knew what was going on beforehand and he, he was a young married man and and his wife had left him, and, uh, and so he knew what the reason was. And the young man called him up and asked him, uh, can you, and he started reading verses about submitting, and uh, that she should submit to him, and that she should, he should help get her, this young man. And it was over the phone, 
And he said, well, have you read the rest of the epistles where it says Christ loved the church? Uh, or have you loved your wife as Christ loved the church? And, uh, and he said, well, I think so. And he said, well, then uh, why, does she, why is she afraid of you? She was afraid of him. She had mistreated her. And then it got kind of quiet. <clears throat> and then uh, at the end, toward the end of the conversation, he said, so if this would work, say I helped you and we would go to your, I would go to your wife and uh, read her these verses about submitting and we would get her back. What kind of a relationship would you have? And he said, well, she'd be my wife. We'd be married. He said, no, not that. What kind of relationship would you have? Well, it would, be, it would have been a forced relationship. It would have been a relationship without love. And, and, and that kind of describes what this was like. He could have forced this, but it would have been a relationship without love. And what kind of relationship was that? You know, there, there is a point where people have to want to come back. And that's what uh, Jesus was saying about this lost son. We, he wanted a love relationship with, his, with people. And this lost son was showing that. So he let him go because he didn't want to force him to stay. He wanted him to stay because he loved him. Uh, and, but the, th the waiting father was, was also saying, I'll let you go, but it will break my heart letting you go. It's not going to be easy for me, but I'll let you do that. So that, that's where we are. Um, uh, we'll, let's go to Luke 15. Turn in your Bibles to Luke 15. And uh, we'll, we'll kind of go this, through this verse by verse. Um, starting with, uh, well, let's, let's start with verse 12. Uh, would you want to start with verse 12 and then we'll just go around? <coughs> okay, so what is that verse telling us? The father. Yeah. And, and it's kind of interesting at the end, he says, and he divided the inheritance between them. So he, he set aside, because the younger or the older son always got uh, at least half of the inheritance. And then the, the other half was divided among the younger ones. So the younger one received his share. He gave it to him. And, you know, I don't, he must have given him um, money's worth. Of what, because he would have owned cattle and sheep and property, but he would have given him a dollar's worth amount uh, of value that he could take, which, which was now his inheritance. And uh, so let's go to 13, Tanya. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Okay, so what happens in this verse? Yeah, yeah. So he, he leaves uh, in verse 13. And what does it say about his inheritance? He squanders it. Okay. Yeah, he squanders it in wild or uh, the word in the Greek uh, is more like a restless, uh, not restless, uh, reckless, more like reckless living. And I thought the, what they did in here was pretty much maybe the way it was, went into inns and they, he bought everybody drinks, uh, had affairs and the whole nine yards until his money was gone. And so th that's, that's what he was wanting instead of the strict lifestyle that his, he had at home. He saw that as much more fun than being out in the field, much more enjoyable. Uh, he didn't want to do the regular things at home. I want to go party with the rest of the people. Um, okay, 14. After he spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. Okay, so what happened in 14? He got hungry. <laughs> okay, he, he, uh, he lost all, and after he, so on, on this reckless living, he lost it all, so he was now penniless, and what we saw there, they threw him out on the ground, they no longer were his friends, if they ever were his friends, they just wanted his money. 
And then because this is a story, Jesus adds to it what happened in the land. Why would Jesus have added that? A famine happens because what? Yeah, everything dries up. The rain, the rain stops. Nothing produces anything. You don't have anything, and and so uh, for this young man, what happens practically every time is that when you leave your father, you leave God. Uh, it eventually dries up. It's it's the wages of sin, is death. The wages of riotous, rest, reckless living is that it all dries up. Uh, and so fa Jesus inserts a famine in there. As, so this, this guy is really destitute and the people around him don't have money to give him as well. So everybody around him was uh, in need and didn't have things to give him. Uh, so he is in a pickle to say the least. Um, 15. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to be paid. Okay, we got a couple of things in here. So he has now found himself in big trouble, doesn't have money to do anything, and these people have all left him. If you, I don't know if you noticed when he left walking away from home, you know, he's got a pretty good strut going on. You know, I'm, I'm going to go have a good time. That is all over now. And so he is uh, looking pretty bad. And uh, so uh, what does it say he does when he finds himself in need? Job, out. Okay. Uh, in the New ASV, it says attached himself. The idea is that he kind of glued himself to someone who had, who would even pay attention to him, and uh, and so uh, attached himself to one of the citizens of the country. So he found someone out in the country that he could find that would even talk to him. So he attached himself. And what did this guy have him have for him to do? Okay. Why would Jesus have put this all together? Just to show kind of how low he went. Like, he was, when he left, he was way high. You know, he had all the money, and, and now he's lost it all, and now he's point where he's as low as a pig. <laughs> and what would that have meant in the Jewish culture? That they don't, they didn't eat. No, a pig was as, you, you, didn't eat, you didn't go around pigs. You say you, you, that was the lowest of the low. They were unclean. You didn't do that. And it was so tough for him that he even took a job, took work for this guy feeding pigs, which would have just absolutely blown the lid off of these scribes and Pharisees' head. They, you know, that is incredibly low, but it is even going to get a little worse than that. So he's, he is, uh, he, he's out there, and this guy, like it shows, sent him, well, it says sent him into the fields. This guy was sent him into a pen it, to feed the pigs. Um, 16, would you read? He longed to fill his stomach with pods that the pigs were eating but no one gave him anything. Okay, another step lower, isn't it? So what was... He wants to eat what they're eating. Yeah. And you think the pigs are really willing to do that? <laughs> I don't think so. So there was a... He was down there trying to grab, I don't know what these pods were. I was thinking of like bean pods or pea pods or whatever they were giving these pigs. And he was willing to try and sneak them from the pigs without the guy that owned him seeing it. And what does it say at the very end of that verse? That no one gave him anything. No one gave him anything. He was not even this guy. You know, he was, I mean, he probably gave him a, a little to eat, but he was pretty much on his own trying to find something to do and a way to, find, to stay alive. But nobody else gave him one thing after he had blown all of his money on them. So we got this kid at the bottom of the rung and there is not much else to do. 
Uh, verse 16. I'm going to read 16. 17? Yep. Oh, yeah, 17. When he came to his senses, senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? Okay, what is the very first section of that verse? Um, when he came to his senses. When he came to his senses. Isn't that where God wants to take all of us? To finally, whether it's to the point where this young man was a feeding pigs, but God tries to get all of us to come to our senses at some point in life where we see what this young man was going to see. So he finally came to his senses, and what, was, what happened when he came to his senses? He realized that his father's servants were living better than he was. Yeah, by far, weren't they? So his, the, the people that were wor working were his, his father's servants were doing much better than he was. Uh, but what, is it, what does it say there at the last? But? I'm starving to death. Yeah, but I'm starving to death. I'm dying of hunger. So he's starting to think of back home, one of the few places there was any chance at all of him going back. But he did not, uh, he did not know if his father would take him back, did he? He really didn't know what was going on back home if his father had totally forgotten him, if his father had moved on, uh, couldn't, wouldn't stand the sight of him. Uh, he just didn't know. And so, um, uh, verse 19, he, t he, says, uh, he says some things in there. Who's, uh, you have 19? Oops, we should have done 18. 18. Boy, I'm getting all messed up here. We'll do 18 first. <laughs> I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Okay. What, what's in that verse? Yeah, a total change of attitude, isn't it? it was, he, he is realizing it was wrong to want to live as though his father was dead. He says, I have sinned. Um, uh, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I have sinned not only against you, Father, but I have sinned against God in the way God had planned things to be. Then let's do, uh, let's see, um, that was 18. He recognizes his sin. Forgot to read it. Uh, let's do uh, 19 then. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Okay. Uh, a huge admission here, isn't it? What, what does he say? Or he's running through his mind that he's going to tell his father. Not only I've sinned, but... I'd be just okay being one of your hired servants. Yeah. And the, 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 the change from uh, back in verse 12, Father, give me my share to this point where he says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He, I've already spent my inheritance as your son. I don't deserve to be your son. Uh, you don't have to take me back. But would you consider taking me back as one of your servants, servants, or as a servant of you? And he's running this through his mind as one of the possibilities. Uh, Looking at being a servant of his father. Okay, uh, next one. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Okay. I, I had uh, them keep this picture up. I think it is just the coolest picture ever. Um, so it says, when he was yet a long way off, and, and, the, and just before this, if he, if he saw him a long way off, what does that tell you about the father? He was waiting for him to return. Yeah, this whole time. He was watching every day, maybe every hour. He kept looking down the road for his son to come back. All this time while he was wasting his money, till his money was gone, we don't know how much time 
uh, he would have spent feeding pigs before he came to this conclusion to go back until he finally decided to come back. And, when, and it says, when he was yet uh, a long way off, his father saw him and did what? Yeah, well, so look, ran, or just before that. Him. Yeah, felt compassion for him. So he wasn't going out there with a stick to beat him. You know, he felt compassion for him because he knew in his heart what was going to happen to this young guy, didn't he? That he, that he was going to blow his money because he could see the way his son was living and wanting to go. He was, that he was going to blow his money. So he first felt compassion for him and then he does what? Runs out to meet him. Which is really interesting that Jesus put it in there. One of the things that noblemen or men of wealth would never do is run. In those days they would never run. People ran to them. And so we've got this nobleman running. You could hear the slap, slap, slap of his sandals on the road as he was running and so when he was a ways off the son would, could have probably thought it was one of the servants running out there or his brother and here it was his dad and dads just did not do that. What, what does that tell us that Jesus was trying to get through to the scribes and Pharisees about this waiting father? What would have been the point? Yeah, and what, what was he willing to do? Now he was willing to pursue him. Now he was willing to go after him when he had finally come to his senses and wanted to come back home. So the father, uh, when we talk about what kind of God is God, Jesus was saying this is the kind of God that God is. This is the kind of God that will run to you after you have run away from me, while you have intentionally run away from me, while you have rebelled against me, while you have gone as far away from me as you could get, uh, I still want you back. I will still take you back. In fact, I will open my arms and run back to you. Um, so, and then at the bottom of it says, he ran to him, embraced him, which the next picture would have shown, or would show, is that he put his arms around him. And uh, how would this young guy have smelled at this point? <laughs> He's been living with the pigs. The last time he had a bath was probably six months ago. Who knows? But he'd have been dirty. Uh, this Bailey, uh, that his, uh, that book through peasant eyes, said he uh, probably turned heads when he was walking away from home because he had money and he had a strut. He turned heads, looking at him, wanting to know, you know, hey, this guy's got something. When he was returning, he turned heads the other way because he smelled so bad and was dirty and filthy and uh, was probably more ragged than that picture actually shows. His, his clothes would have been probably filthy, dirty if he was, uh, you know, where would he have slept in that time? He, they certainly wouldn't have given him a room. So, I, uh, and then verse uh, 21. Uh, where are we at here? Yep, okay. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Okay, so what is that verse telling us? He just is admitting he knows what he did was wrong. It shows he learned uh, from his mistakes. And he's kind of almost begging, begging for forgiveness. Yeah. And, he, and he's following through, isn't he? he? He would have repeated this over and over in his mind of what he was going to say to his father. And sometimes when you get to that point where you actually meet the a father, you don't have the wherewithal to say it. And he actually 
says it right out there, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Uh, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Again, that huge difference between give me and I am no longer worthy. Um, and then we got this, this huge, to him, unexpected thing that the father does, this waiting father in 22. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Okay, so the reception was not only that he met him on the road, was it? That he put his arms out like that to welcome him back. Uh, but what did he do? Told the servants to... Yeah, he treated, I mean, he treated him just like a son. Like he had never been... Yeah. He had never loved. Like he had never left. But, You know, so like, no. it was like abundant or extravagant. Yeah, very extravagant. That's a, yeah, that's a great word for it. He was very extravagant with him. He didn't just accept him back as his son, like the son would have not even thought about. You know, he was thinking about being a servant and living in the servant's quarters and being back in the family was just beyond his comprehension. And then he puts a robe on him and they have a party. And remember what we were saying about when the shepherd found the lost sheep, Jesus included, and they had a party, invited everybody over. I found this lost sheep that has wandered away. Uh, the crazy woman, when she found the coins, they had a party, they rejoiced up through the cracks. Again, Jesus includes it in this waiting father. Let's have a party, Let it, let's rejoice when my son who was lost has come back home and not only have a party, we're gonna put on robes because he is now son. He is my son is back. It was more than just like a lost sheep or a lost coin and a ring on his finger. The ring on his finger was immensely important because that was something that said, you are part of the family again. Uh, when, when you walked into town, the, ins the inscription on the ring would have said Schwartz or whatever the family's name was. You know, I'm part of that family uh, again, even after I was gone. So it, it was quite a deal. You think like the father too, like he knew, like if his son ever returned, he, he had already probably decided what he was going to do. Like it was probably all pre premeditated. It wasn't just like that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point because the son always was was thinking at the end here, what's it going to be like when I go back to my father and how is it going to be? Will he even take me back as a, as a servant? And the father had to be thinking at, in the evenings when he would go into the son's room and sit by his bed uh, weeping over his lost son or there was an empty chair at the table. If he would by any chance return what am I going to do? And, and that, that really hits a nail on the head that, okay, let's have a party. Let's, re let's rejoice. I'm going to make him a son, back as a son again. Um, so th this is a story. What, what is Jesus trying to tell the scribes and Pharisees through this story? What kind of God is God and what kind of God are you portraying? Way different, isn't it? Yeah, he said forgiven. Yeah, and the scribes and Pharisees were not. They they were not the forgiving kind. In fact, we're gonna we're gonna see just the opposite. Uh, they were unhappy when we started this. They were unhappy because Jesus was associating and eating with uh, with sinners, and so there was a grumbling going on. And so they would have not at all been like this. It was totally opposite of what they would have done. And so Jesus was pointing out to them, the kind of God that God is, is not the kind of God you're portraying or you're living like. Um, um, 20, let's do 23. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Okay. 
So this, re this whole rejoicing in that short of verse 24, and the reason for it is 24. For his son of, for his, this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, so they began to celebrate. Okay, what does he say about this son? He was, he had counted him as dead, which is kind of interesting because the son started out wanting the father to be dead so he could get his inheritance. And, and now the father says, my son was dead and has come back to life. My son was lost and he has found, he has come back to me. So that, 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 was, that was really cool. Um, so um, this, the picture of this, uh, of a, a father running with his arms out to, uh, to bring his prodigal son or his lost son home is a picture. And, and we don't, we're not given a, you know, what did Jesus do when he was telling the story? Did he say, you know, did he uh, reach his arms out and say, you know, that the father reached out for him? But Jesus certainly did do it later on. Uh, would you want to put that picture up and we'll do that song? I, it, this is such a foretelling picture of what Jesus was going to do. The picture is striking, isn't it? The father wanting to reach out wide to open his arms for the son to come back. Jesus on the cross, his hands nailed wide to keep them open for all mankind to come back. And that's the story we have to give is that to those around us is that Jesus' arms are open wide for lost sheep, for lost coins, for lost sons. The people that the scribes and Pharisees were saying, why in the world are you after them? Why are you talking to them? That's why. What kind of God is God? That's the kind of God God is. The one that would sacrifice his son on the cross with his arms open wide to welcome us back. And, and Revelation talks about when we get to heaven, what are we going to be? We are going to be heirs and sons of God. We are going to be uh, in robes and treated as uh, as sons, as as richly and ex the word you, extravagant that Tanya that you used is the way God is going to treat us when we get back, when we get home. Such a such a cool deal. Even though, like the thief on the cross, was only believed in Jesus for a couple of minutes before he died is going to be there along with everybody else. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, God's arms are open wide was a picture that Jesus was trying to show the Pharisees. That's the kind of God is. He's inclusive. You are exclusive. You're trying to make uh, Judaism back then or Christianity exclusive to a small group that you can control. And God is saying, that's not the kind of God I am. I open my arms wide for everybody. The very least and lowest are welcome in. Uh, did, did this affect the Pharisees and Sadducees? Uh, turn to John, and, and mo to most of them not. It seems like to most of them not, but we're not given a clear record. We've got John 3, 1 through 10 as the first one. Where are we at here? I don't even know who read last. Did you read last? You did? Okay, Tanya, would you want to take John 3, 1 through 10? <coughs> and we're going to visit one of the, these guys, uh, Nicodemus, who, um, you know, we're not given a record that he was there at this time. Maybe he heard about the, these parables, but this is going to be the effect that Jesus' message had on him. And there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. 
Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, and the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born in the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do not and do you not understand these things? So, yep, you're done. So, Nicodemus, what's did you, did you notice what's different about this conversation than than almost all of the conversations Jesus has with other rabbis or teachers? Is he doing it in a rabbinic style? No. He, it, it, it didn't strike me till I read, was reading that this week. He, he never answered a question like when he said, what must I do to be saved? He didn't ask him a question back because Nicodemus wasn't trying to trick him. It wasn't a debate. Nicodemus was sincerely looking for an answer to that. And so Jesus answered him back appropriately saying this is what you must do to be saved um, I was good there was one other thing um, well, I, was, I thought verse 10 was interesting are you you are you a teacher of Israel and do not understand these things kind of saying you know it's kind of a mystery you've you're you've a, you're a rabbi or a teacher just like I you've read all of the Old Testament you've memorized it uh, and yet you don't understand these things. You know, how does this, how can this happen? Uh, then let's do uh, John 7, 50 to 51. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier, and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? So what is what is Nicodemus saying to these guys? You better listen to Jesus, don't you? So so Nicodemus was convinced of what Jesus said. He was he was not saying Jesus you you don't have, know what you're saying. He was convinced and he was back telling these others, "Why why are you condemning this man when you haven't really even really listened to him? Let's listen to what he has to say." And then uh, John 19, 39. He was accompanied, accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus. <coughs> Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Okay, so was Nicodemus serious about this? Because they had planned, planted uh, spies among the people. Trying, and so Nicodemus came to Jesus when? at night, didn't he? So he met him at night, so it seems a little suspicious. You know, either he was trying to trick him or catch him in something that he would report back, or he was afraid of what the others were done, which is probably the latter. He was, wasn't, didn't want to raise the ire of the other scribes and Pharisees before he really knew what Jesus was saying about a man must be born again. And so we know, we know he is serious by this verse, because what is he doing? Yeah, he's helping burying him. He brought what? Murder. Yep. Owls. Which were embalming articles to embalm him. So, so Nicodemus had fallen in love with Jesus. It was just like the father wanted a love relationship with the son. Jesus wanted a love relationship with Nicodemus, and he got it. Nicodemus was there because. He wanted to be there. He is, in a way, kind of like this prodigal son coming back to where he should have been instead of fighting with him all the time. So it, it's a Nicodemus is a cool picture of way, the way all of these scribes and Pharisees could have or should have act, acted toward Jesus. 
but instead it created such a grumbling and anger among them that they started their plot to kill him and to put him away because the crowds were so big he was being heralded as the, the person of the hour, person of the day. He was healing people, he was, had these great teachings and they were kind of pushed to the sideline. So instead of like Nicodemus said to him, why do you condemn him before you've listened to him? He, uh, he had accepted what he had, went and found out what Jesus was saying, accepted it and became his child, uh, returned to him just like the prodigal son. You know, I hope so. <laughs> you know, we're not given record of it. Uh, and, you know, because we, well, we're not given record of everything, but I would sure hope that, you know, Nicodemus had a friend that he went back and said, man, this guy's for real. You know, I, I certainly hope so. It'd be really sad if Nicodemus was the only one. So we're going to, we're going to get to uh, um, go back to Luke 15, just about out of time. Jesus wanted to make Jesus wanted to make two points, two big points. I think one was that he had come for everybody, and uh, and he had made that point with these parables, and now at the We've got one more to go as part of this, and it was the it's the older brother, and how the father treated in the the he he actually go he pursues the older brother when he wouldn't come in. If you remember the picture, he walks out and pursues the older brother, saying, "Come on in." Come in and party with us. And what? We'll, let's uh, let's see where are we at. Uh, let's just read through it uh, just to prepare for uh, next week. Um, well, yeah, I'll, I'll just read through it, starting with verse twenty. Excuse me, starting with verse twenty-five. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing, and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring that these what these things might be. And he said to him, Your brother has come. And your father has killed a fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began entreating him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours. And yet you have never given me a kid that I might be merry with my friends. But when, his son, but when this son of yours came, who, is, who has devoured your wealth, with harlots you kill the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, My child, you have always been with me. All that is mine is yours. But we had to be merry and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and is now alive, was lost, and is found. Jesus is going, was in the beginning of this, was pointing to the least and the lost. Now he's going to turn and we're going to talk about the scribes and Pharisees. This is a perfect picture of who the scribes and Pharisees were, the son was not rejoicing, he was grumbling, right? What were the scribes and Pharisees doing when this all started? They were grumbling. So we, he's, he's going back and now he's going to focus on this and, then, and there's another parable we're going to add next week to this that is going to show this older brother mentality of not rejoicing and not being happy when uh, the lost son returns, or the sheep is found, or the coin is found, um, and and what that means, and how we can fall into that is how we're what we're going to go into next week. Um, any questions on what we've done today? Make sense? I could. I, I just love this parable, and then the one that. The one that we're going to do, uh, I forgot to look if that came right after this, is the, uh, 
is the guys that he that this uh, guy hired to work in his vineyard. Some work so many hours, some work less, well, less and less, and and what was stirred up was the same grumbling. And that and that parable is focused on the Pharisees and Sadducees as well. So we're going to connect the two of those next week and uh, point out how some sometimes we can be happy when things aren't fair. Can we be happy when things aren't fair? Probably not in our nature to do so, but God is always wants us to be. Let's bow for a word of prayer in closing. Heavenly Father, thank you for this parable that you've given us about the prodigal son and the shepherd and the coin as well. And, uh, and what they've taught us about how much you care about the least and the lost, and which is caring about us and the people around us and uh, those that we may sometimes walk by and not uh, think about they, that they need you as well. So help us remind us this week as we meet people that uh, don't know you as their savior that we can do something to reach out to them, a kind word, uh, a meal or something that will show your love to them. Keep us safe and uh, in your name I pray, amen. Thanks.